Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Reverend Deborah L. Johnson. Reverend Deborah Johnson is the founding minister and president of Inner Light Ministries, an omnifaith outreach ministry dedicated to teaching the practical application of universal spiritual principles to all of life's circumstances. She holds a vision of oneness beyond creed and doctrine and feels particularly called to heal the sense of separation between those adhering to conservative and progressive ideologies, something that we'll talk a little bit about today. She is founder and president of the Motivational Institute, an organizational development consulting firm specializing in cultural diversity, serving the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. As a dynamic public speaker, she is known for her ability to bring clarity to complex and emotionally charged issues. So with that, hello, Reverend. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, well, thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. I've had a, um, a real pleasure listening to some of your talks and um, some of your messages as I prepared for this interview. And uh, I was particularly drawn to, you know, your thoughts on uh, the conflict between kind of conservative and progressive ideologies and ways in which we can kind of transcend um, these conflicts um, mm -hmm. through different spiritual teachings. So I do want to talk a little bit about that today, but I'd love to okay. start just a little bit about um, with the story of how you've evolved toward the work that you're doing. I know you mentioned in uh, several of your messages that you started out in a fundamentalist Christian background. So sure. what brought you from fundamentalist Christianity to this omnifaith perspective? Well, I grew up in Los Angeles, mm. um, which is an extremely, extremely diverse yeah. um, place. And um, I read something not too long ago where there are actually more religions that are practiced in Los Angeles than any other city in the world. Wow. Um, and I can actually believe that. Yeah. Um, so whereas um, there's much about the faith that I grew up in that I believed in terms of its sense of, of power and connectedness with the divine, but the exclusionary nature of it just did not make any sense to me, right. particularly when I grew up in such a multicultural environment. This idea that there could be a God that only liked certain people <laughs> and that and that only people who believed a certain kind of way were in favor, um, it just didn't resonate with me. Hmm. Um, besides the fact that um, I always knew I was gay and this idea that by nature I was satanic yeah. and God didn't have any place for me it just, it didn't resonate. So it sent me on a really deep, deep path about what is our inter interconnectedness? What is this value that we can all bring to the table? And how do we find a way to make this happen? LA was always going up in flames. Mm. It's like, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you always knew you were gay. Was that uh, yes. from the very beginning? It wasn't sort of a, a moment of recognition. It was something that you felt from the very beginning. Well, you know, if I'm really truthful about it, I didn't have a concept right. for gay. Yeah, me neither. So, so I think in my younger years, I used to wonder if perhaps I was some kind of trans or intersect. Mm -hmm. It's just that, that my own sense of gender identity, I wasn't confused that I was a girl, but, but the social um, constructs that were placed on that, the gender conformity... Mm -hmm. I, I didn't relate to it. You know, I, I, I wanted to be the hero that got the girl. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to be the damsel in distress that was rescued by the knight in the shining wine armor. I wanted to be the knight in the shining wine armor and get the girl. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's like I always knew there was something, <laughs> but it wasn't until I was probably in the seventh grade that I could name it. Mm -hmm. and know, oh, that's what, that's that, what is. that is. Yeah. Well, I'm <laughs> okay. sure, I'm sure you've been the hero who got the girl a few times. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, just sort of with, within that context of, of fundamentalist Christianity, I'm just curious, you know, if you encountered any um, conflict with your family when you sort of um, accepted this, came out, and then also sort of came out at, as this sort of 
radical, at least in comparison to that point of view, spiritual thinker. Um, was that something that you did it sort of evolve um, in a in a harmonious way or was there some cacophony? Well, conflict would probably be the understatement of the century. <laughs> <laughs> if it was only conflict, um, it probably wouldn't have been so bad. Uh -huh. um, but 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 you really have to put it into historical context as yeah. well. You know, so I'm born in the mid '50s. You know, right. I'm dating myself, but it's important in terms of the life story. Of course. So it wasn't until I was halfway through college before the sodomy laws were taken away, which meant that any sort of activity between people of the same sex was a felon. We're talking 20 years. Mm. It's at the same time, the American Psychiatric Association decided to change its mind and we weren't psychotic. Yeah, right. So, you know, in my parents' mind, I, you know, I'm going to prison. Mm. <laughs> you know, this was not... Let alone hell. Yeah, this, it, exactly. So there was... <laughs> There was hell, there was prison, there was, you know, insanity and all the rest of this stuff. So, you know, poor people, they were just fighting for my life, but it was a fight. There was no question about it. Mm. So do you have any, you know, uh, having seen the LGBT community kind of evolve so much, and then we'll, I'm just curious about all this because it wasn't really planned to talk about it, but I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on... Um, the LGBT community and how it's evolved maybe in relationship to your spiritual work? Um, yes, I do. And ironically enough, um, on Friday, I'm speaking at Yale University oh, um, at the Black Student Conference there on the intersection between spirituality and sexuality. Mm. Um, they're having a whole, a whole conference on dealing with, with sexual identity issues and issues of sexuality in the African-American community. Um, you know, wh what I can say is that it's really important that you be fully integrated, that all aspects of your life come together, your, your intellect, your emotions, your social political activity, your personal relationships, you know, your identity, your, your hobbies, your gifts. I mean, like you've got to pull it all together. And the divine, however you want to think of it, wants all of us whole, mm -hmm. not chopping up bits and pieces of ourselves and leaving them behind. Because that's when we get into shadows and that's when we get into addictive behavior and, you know, mistreatments of each other. So love yourself. <laughs> Give yourself permission to be yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so that you can unleash your gifts. Yeah. So do you think um, that due to, for example, m so many LGBT people having to resist their own kind of narrow Judeo-Christian upbringing, that there is... Um, there are challenges that are presented when LGBT people then are seeking some kind of spiritual path because spirit was so kind of monopolized in many of our experiences. And of course, I'm speaking also for myself um, yeah. of this kind of narrow, you know, um, hateful or at least vengeful or spiteful deity in the sky with thunderbolts. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, I, I knew of you. I, I I was introduced to you through Science and Non-Duality Conference, and and when I was there, I sort of noticed that, at least from my perspective, it didn't seem like there was a lot of LGBT people, and and I just I mean, even though in the yoga community, I think that there are a large representative of of LGBT. Um, I, I still wonder if there's not a disproportionately less amount of people in the kind of spiritual community. Is that something that resonates with you, or do you have a different perspective on that? Well, n no, I think I think you're accurate. Um, I think what has happened is that, and and it's not just about this issue. What happens is that if people have been wounded, or people have felt like they have been abused in certain kinds of ways, mm -hmm. they they want to turn against it. Okay, so what ends up happening is that for so many LGBT people, they have associated religion. Mm -hmm. with being dogmatic, yeah. with being homophobic, and all of the rest of that. And, and that's just a narrow spin. Mm -hmm. It isn't the all of it. So what's happened is that in protest to religious abuse, 
too many LGBT people have forsaken their own spirituality yeah. in, in protest. But we, we have to be leery of that. I, I mean, I look at marriage equality, for example, and, and I'm amazed that that became the predominant issue <laughs> um, for the LGBT community. When we first were early activists, you know, right after Stonewall, we were questioning marriage yeah. as a patriarchal, you, you know, the feminist in me was like, oh, questioning monogamy, yeah. you know, and all of that. And, you know, I'm the first one in line getting married um, <laughs> <laughs> when the laws, you know, when the laws change. Um, so th there's this way where, where I, I had turned my back on, quote unquote, family values yeah. out of protest. Um, a lot of people turn their, their, their back on their own economic wealth out of protest of how people have misused it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the alcoholism rate, um, disproportionately high in LGBT people, suicides rate disproportionately high. And it's because of this sort of a spiritual crisis that we find ourselves in not really embracing ourselves. Mm. The good news and I know we're you don't want to just talk about this exclusively, but the good news is um, I was at a conference just a couple of months ago called Rolling the Stone Away. Mm. And I want to encourage people to check out that website because it was a whole conference on archiving the LGBT movement along religious issues. Mm. And they flew in scores of us who have been vets in this movement for such a long time recording our stories, and you can really see just how much progress has been made in religious issues by the LGBT community in ways that are very uplifting and inspiring. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, I did. I hadn't intended to talk about that topic, but I think it's so interesting, and I'm glad it sort of came up uh, organically for us. So maybe that's a nice segue to um, to talking about a little bit about uh, since it's sort of, you know, a political issue, but we could sort of extend it to this larger issue of of polarization. And, and one thing that I really liked about one of your talks, uh, I think it was a TED talk, is that you mentioned that, you know, it's polarization, not differences of opinion are is what is leading to conflict. So I'm curious, you know, how do we get from differences of opinion to this polarization that we're seeing, you know, what is the the structure of society and and maybe even of psychology that that hears differences or sees differences of opinion and then becomes polarized by them? Yes. Um, so what you're referencing to is this this epiphany. I have this series called Letters from the Infinite. I mm -hmm. literally get these downloads, and that's a common theme in these letters that that conflict is not the differences of opinion, it's the polarization mm -hmm. around the differences of opinion. Differences of opinion in and of themselves don't cause conflict. You know, you think A, I think B, you know, there's no conflict. There, there's no conflict until we polarize around it. And, and as far as this underlying question that you're asking here is that too many of us associate safety with sameness. Mm, mm. And we associate love with sameness. That if, if you love me, you emulate me. If you love me, you are like me. And if you're not like me, then you really don't love me. You know, this is part of the reason why kids have a trouble individuating, for example, in families. Because as a family, we do this. We think this way. Mm. We're in this kind of community. We, we practice this kind of religion. We have these kinds of marriages. And, and if you don't ascribe to that, then somehow or another, you're a traitor. You know, you've betrayed us. So you'll have a lot of times people won't even consider another view, talk to other people out of loyalty to quote unquote their side from which they don't want to be banned. And this notion of the safety in sameness that somehow or another, if you're different, that's a threat. Mm -hmm. And this is problematic. And when I'm speaking, I'm speaking on the micro level and the macro level. These same things play true in our most interpersonal relationships 
as well as global relationships, that somehow or another, if you're different, then I'm going to be hurt or harmed. My sense of safety is in the sameness. Mm -hmm. We see this developmentally, like with teenagers and adolescents. Nobody wants to be different. Everybody wants to be like cookie cutter, you know, just the same. And it gets back to that sense of belonging. And, you know, am I really a part of the tribe? Am I lovable? Like, will I be loved? And quite frankly, we need to grow up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I mean, I just got to be frank about it. We just really need to grow up. So, you know, what you're saying is really resonant for me. And, 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 and obviously there's, to a certain degree, this um, desire for sameness has perhaps, you know, been existing for quite a long time. But it seems like the polarization or, you know, we always saw Democrats and Republicans disagreeing and it was like obviously a difference of opinion. But it feels like the tone now has become like increasingly apocalyptic, like it's increasingly polarized. So do you have any reflections on sort of what is different now, you know, in comparison? Or maybe you see it as having always been that polarized and just um, now we're starting to feel it. But anyway, it just, what, is there anything about no. the structure of what's going on right now that's leading to that? Yes, yes. There, there's no question that the structure of the polarization is is different. And part of it is that if you look at the history, I mean, and this is happening globally, but if we're talking about right now here with mm-hmm. the United States, if you look at the history of the United States, we've always been a nation divided. Mm-hmm. We've always been with a sense of an internal contradiction within ourselves that we have set up institutionally with this notion of like states' rights. Like we can have an overarching view but then we allow people to sort of do whatever it is they want to do. So it's been built in right with that idea of slave states and free states. It, and I go to that because it's, it's as fundamental as that, where we have tried to grow up and exist with these different realities. And what's happening now is that we're at a point where the house divided cannot stand. And there literally is a battle going on about what is going to be the predominant world view. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. That when this nation was founded, we did not have a view of a multiracial, multi-ethnic, interfaith, gender equal, you know, inclusive society. That was not our foundation. Our foundation was something else. And there are people who are still wedded to that original foundational view about who should rule, who should have the goods, where the wealth should be, who should be in control, that is going up against a new worldview of a concept of like a global citizenship. Mm -hmm. And this is deep. And we cannot stay with this divide. And, and the way that I would put it, um, and I don't mean to sound apocalyptic, <laughs> but I, I, we're, we're, we're now going against history. We're, we're going against the tide. We're going against sort of global evolution and where the world is going by trying to step backwards into this very nationalistic, very, you know, me, my, you know, my race, my country, my religion, my nation, we're the best, we're the greatest, you know, that's over. And, and I like the way that Martin Luther King put it about segregation. He said, the days of racial segregation are over. You can be certain about it. The only thing uncertain is how costly the segregationists will make the funeral. Mm. And that's what's happening now. The days of global imperialism are over. The days of racial supremacy are over. Those days are over. 
were just in a really costly funeral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for us to some degree to, and a lot of things we're mentioning are sort of maybe characteristic of what we might call the kind of more conservative worldview. And obviously mm -hmm. you and I are on the side, most people would say of the progressive side. But I think that, you know, from even from that part of your bio that mentions it, you know, healing this adherence to conservative and progressive ideologies, you seem to have also a criticism of, of some progressive ideologies. So I'm oh, curious, yes. so I'm curious what, you know, um, what, what are those, what, what do you see happening in the progressive movement movement that is sort of, um, disallowing us, uh, to move past this kind of conflict, this polarization? Well, like how are we contributing to that, to that polarization we're, we're, we're control we're contributing to the polarization from, from a lack of empathy mm. and for not assuming full responsibility for this the disruptions that our progress makes in the lives of other people mm -hmm. and and if, if I look back at the movements that have been more a little bit more successful they've taken that into account women and men they had to work it out. It, it wasn't just equal rights. The women knew this was completely shifting their relationship with their men. Yeah. And they were having to completely redefine what that was and work it out. But we've gotten into the situation now where we're trying to win over people instead of trying to win them over. Mm. <laughs> we're we're yeah. trying to win over them. And, and if I give you a, a, an example of what I mean when I say not accepting the responsibility um, if you take something like marriage equality and the proponents of it just completely miss it. They think it's individual rights. It's not messing with anything. Why should anybody care? Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I understand it. Like I said, I, I resonate a lot with that side. But here's what I know. And I use mathematics as an example, okay? Mm -hmm. One plus one equals two. You can't prove that. You have to accept that. Now, if you accept it, you have all kinds of axioms and theorems and postulates and all these things that can develop out of it, but you cannot prove one plus one equals two. But here's the catch. One plus one has to equal two everywhere in the world or all of mathematics is going to fall down. There can't be one spot in the world where one plus one does not equal two. And for these more conservative people, this idea of a binary male, female construct, that there's absolute male and that there's absolute female and that these two together are the are the foundation stone of all of society, that's their one plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that's their one plus one equals two. So to give that up is is like the whole structure of civilization's gonna fall. And they are as passionate about this as environmentalists are about not having the planet burn up on their watch. So the folks like my mom, they're just, you don't have a right to change one plus one equals two. Right. <laughs> you know, now we'll give you your rights. You can have domestic partnerships, you can have, but you cannot redefine the family. You know, you can't redefine marriage because one plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. And it, so this stuff is huge. And I don't think the proponents of the change are realizing. So, what, so then what happens is that we can't be trusted because these people are looking and going, you don't even, you're like a kid. You don't even understand what you're doing. You don't even understand the massiveness of the change that you are about, so how can I trust you with the family as an institution? Mm. How can I trust you with these things when you can't even see the impact that you're having? 
So I think it's time for us to grow up, the progressive, everybody to grow up and say, yes, we want these changes and look at what this does to society. Look at the impact that it's having on these people. At least admit it, at least own it. You know what I mean? At least talk about it. <laughs> so we can negotiate here. What is this gonna look like? What is this new world of this we that, that we're gonna create? You don't have to be afraid of us. It's not there goes the neighborhood, like there goes marriage, there goes the neighborhood. We wanna be in the neighborhood with you. We wanna be good neighbors. Mm. So how can we do this so that my reality doesn't destroy your world? Yeah, yeah. So it's not about, you know, if this is their one plus one equals two, it's not about, you know, destroying their conception of mathematics and replacing it with something else because that's the structure of their entire world. It's about um, understanding that you're speaking to someone f with that kind of a, a structure. Like what's... Um, and, no, and, and, and uh, let me be more specific. It's that's the paradigm that they're working with. Mm -hmm. But these are Copernican moments. Like when Copernicus says that the, that the sun is not revolving around the earth and that the earth is not the center of the universe, this is huge. Mm -hmm. when, when, when Darwin comes and says, we have evolved out of primates, this is huge. So that whole absolute male, absolute female construct, it isn't true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's not, I mean, hormonally, it's not true. Biologically, it's not true. We're all a combination of the two. Yeah. Okay. But it's a huge shift is what I'm saying. I see, is, yeah. is that, that when we're disrupting people's realities, we can't just take the rug from underneath. There has to be education. Mm -hmm. There has to be some explanations. There have to be some different things that are going on so that we're not just leaving them behind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, there's a, there's a knee jerk sort of response on behalf of those people who do want to see this kind of change of, uh, you know, vilifying and, and deeming, you know, ignorant and, in, and incapable of change, those people who hold to those particular views. So there's like an insensitivity to, to, hey. to the, you right. know, the ability of some people to, to change at the pace that we, you know, quote unquote, expect them to. And, and so my next question, I guess, is then, you know, related to how much anger, there is on both sides. And you mentioned in another talk that anger and freedom cannot exist in the same space, which exactly. I, which was a beautiful uh, thing. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. And then also, I'm just curious, you know, is there a role for righteous anger in, in this whole scheme of things? Um, yes, there is a role for righteous anger. Okay. But that can't lead to a sense of separation. Mm. It, it's like, for what, for what point? What, why are you marching in the streets? Why are you doing it? If you're, you, if you're doing it just to do the blame and the shame game, <laughs> then judgment begets judgment. Mm -hmm. There's no shift. See, there's no change. You know, Martin Luther King always said, you know, that he wanted to live a long life, but if, if his physical death would save his children and his white brothers from a permanent psychological death, mm. he could think of no act that would be more redemptive. Mm -hmm. so, so, so what I would say is that we have to start looking at our nation more like a family. Okay. Like I want to save the family. I want the family to come out whole leave no one behind. So we're all doing the same thing to each other. So one side is saying you're intransigent and you can't change. And the other side is saying you're reckless with too much change. Um, and it's like the cactus and the flower debating, you know, the cactus says to the flower, you drink too much water, you know, and the, and the rose, I mean, says to the rose and the rose says to the cactus, you don't drink enough. 
we're, we're just we're, we're just going back and forth here without it getting anywhere. And and I'm deeply concerned. I've never been as concerned as I am now. Not that the conservatives are as conservative as they are, but that the so-called progressives are as being as nasty and as mean and as as mean spirited it as the things that they're fighting against. So it, it's like we're being sucked into this lack of civility. We're being sucked into this whirlpool of venom. Yeah. And we have to recalibrate, you know, energetically, we have to recalibrate back to a place of wholeness, back to a, back to a place of integration where we want to all come out of this thing together. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I am seeing now. And that concerns me deeply. There's just, I want to win and get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that, that part of that has to do with the lack of contemplative practices and these abilities to heal our whatever traumas are triggering us? And so then those socio-political issues then trigger these traumas. And so we're just sort of in this kind of, you know, cycle of reactivity. Does that? Yes. Does, yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I believe, I believe that's a big part of it in terms of the cycle of reactivity. But I also keep coming back to the same point, which is that it's a purpose of intent. What is your vision? Mm -hmm. So we just came out of all of the Martin Luther King Jr. celebrations, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, obviously his most famous speech is the I Have a Dream speech. And yeah. people only really listen to a little part of that. But they're not even listening to the little part of that. When he says, I have a dream, his dream is heretical. His, his, his dream was about these little white girls and, 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 you know, and black boys and girls holding hands together. They'd have been lynched for that. His, mm. his dream was about the sons of slaves and the sons of slave owners hand in hand, okay? Is our dream now that the sons and daughters of the progressives and the sons and daughters of the alt-right <laughs> walking hand in hand? Is our dream the, the sons and daughters of the Nazis and the sons and daughters of the Holocaust survivors walking hand in hand? See, now, if that seems too heretical, then you don't have the dream. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Is, is, it, is, it, is, is it really our goal to get over it? Is it really our goal to have a place where one day our children are not living this divisiveness that we have? Mm-hmm. And, and that's important because if that's your vision, then you're going to go about doing your politics a different way. What way is that? You will go about your politics in such a way as that you will teach your kids and the words that come out your mouth won't be so villainizing as to represent these other people as disposable as non-redeemable, mm -hmm. as, you know, the enemy that we need to get rid of. You, 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 you won't do that. It would be the same as when I hear my white friends tell me, you know, some of them will say, you know, my parents are really, really racist. Others will say, my parents taught me that everybody has value. Mm -hmm that everybody has value and to be nice. It doesn't matter if they're black or this or that, you know, you still respect them. And we need to be able to say that. We need to be able to say, you know what? We still need to have a decency. We still need to have a respect. I'm really, really concerned about what are the children seeing? Is anybody modeling anything that we would want our children to actually emulate. 
for I real. Know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, it resonates that that statement sort of resonates a little bit with what you remarked on in one of your messages about how the pace of technology, the pace of society isn't exactly lined up with the evolution of ethics, you know, and the yes. And the and these sort of values that you're that you're sort of you know talking to, and and that's sort of frightening, right? That we have all this new technology, but then we don't really have the discourse around how to use it in the most holistic and healthiest way. Yes, and and we can, you know, King said, you know, back in the '60s, with our technologies, we've made of the world um, a neighborhood. Yeah. But we have yet to have made of it a brotherhood. And so our capacity, I mean, we're looking at it with Twitter, my God, you know, our our capacity to be able to communicate things has grown at a faster pace than our ethics, than our morality. And like just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm-hmm. But the good news is that. The technologies is also making such a big difference. What I find amongst young people now, for example, there's less nationalism. Mm-hmm. There's, there's less of a sense that because we're from the United States, we are inherently better yeah. <laughs> than everybody else. Yeah. You know, more, more of a sense of a global engagement, even if they're playing video games, with somebody, you know, across the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I look at the way that people are sharing and doing more things that are interfaith or like intercultural. And it, and it gives me good, it gives me good hope Mm -hmm. that if we use these technologies in a good way, in a positive way, that it can really bring us much closer together but I keep coming back to the same point. But that's what we have to want. Mm-hmm. It, as King said, it's not going to ride in on the wings of inevitability. <laughs> that we we have to want a whole, compassionate, respectful society. Mm. And we have to articulate that, not just what we don't want. We're very good now at talking about what we don't want, but pain pushes until vision pulls. And we got to quit just talking about what we don't like and what we don't want. And it's important that we keep putting forth the vision of what we do want. Mm -hmm. So we have something to rally around, not simply against. Yeah, yeah. So... What's the role of <clears throat> forgiveness, you know, in this whole, in, in this, um, in what we're talking about? Because you, I was listening to another talk and it was, you were talking about forgiveness, not just being about letting people off the hook, which is how people often interpret it. <clears throat> and when I'm thinking about the kind of larger, you know, when we look back through history and we see this sort of evolution of a, of vast, you know, disproportionate accumulation of wealth and, uh, you know, different communities disproportionately dealing with material, you know, vacuity of some kind or another. And, you know, I imagine some people would say, well, I can't just forgive that because that and that will leave these structural inequalities in place. So how do we forgive while at the same time still addressing, still address these sort of, you know, inequalities that need to be addressed? First off, we understand forget we we misunderstand forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness is not for the other person. Mm-hmm. The forgiveness is for you. Okay, so I'm a Bible instructor, and I know that seems ironic, having been beaten up with the Bible, but I'm a Bible <laughs> instructor. <laughs> wow. Okay, and the original language of the New Testament was in Greek. And Greek has many tenses that we don't have. And one of them is called the middle voice, which means that the action is impacting the actor. Mm -hmm. We don't even have a way of saying that in the English language, that our actions impact us. And like when that word is being used, it's being used in that middle voice tense, that 
The forgiveness is for you. If you don't forgive, what you're saying is, I'm going to stay stuck. What, what you're saying is that I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to see anything else. I'm never going to feel more empowered than I feel in this moment. I'm not going to have any more compassion. I'm not going to have any more empathy. I'm not going to have any more love. It's, this is my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> and what happens is that the lack of forgiveness is like drinking a gallon of, of poison and praying the other person's going to die. That it, it, yeah. it impacts you. And if you look at any great civil rights leader, from Nelson Mandela to, to Malala, you know, and I love the way, you know, when Oprah was asking, like, aren't you angry, the people that shot you in the face? And she's like, I don't have time for that. There's too much work to be done in the world. Mm -hmm. so, it, so when we don't forgive, we're making a God out of the thing we don't forgive because mm -hmm. we're allowing mm -hmm. it to define us. We are allowing it to tell us how much we are or not. And it's like, no, don't make a God out of the enemy. Don't make a God out of the mistakes. So you, you have to forgive to free yourself, to empower yourself. Now, that's what the forgiveness does. But we make the mistake, and it says it very well, I think, in Scripture, in what we call the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We can't forgive the debts. We, we, we can't forgive slavery or the Holocaust. We can't, it's not in our human capacity to do that. The only thing that we can do is on our one-on-one -on -one human relationships, forgive each other some, have some compassion, get to know each other, do what I've been talking about, like get a little bit more love in our hearts or something so that we don't stay arrested and frozen in a single moment in time that disempowers all of us. But yeah. there is such a thing as karma. You can look at it however you want to call it. What goes around, comes around, it, whatever. It, it, your forgiveness cannot wipe that out, <laughs> okay? <laughs> don't worry about anybody getting off the hook. There's no getting off the hook. For every action, there is a reaction. There is a consequence. And you can't erase the consequences. But when it comes and you're in forgiveness, everybody's healed by it. Mm -hmm. It's not just punitive. It's not just punishing. But everybody grows when the healing is coming out of that consciousness of forgiveness. Mm. Beautiful. So our, I guess our last question, I feel like we've, we've evolved to this point really nicely with our discussion. Um, something you talk about a lot is agapeo. Am I saying that right? Love? Agapeo. Agapeo. Agapeo love. So, you know, sort of as the last question, you know, what is agapeo love and, and how do we cultivate it and how does it relate to what we're talking about? Yes. So in the English language, we just have one word for love. Right. That everything from, you know, how I feel about my football team to my connection with the divine, this, yeah. this one word. But there are other languages, like Greek, for example, that the New Testament is, it has a lot of words for love. There's, there's phileo love, which is the, the familiar kinship love. There's eros love, which is romantic love. Well, this agapeo love is a particular kind of love. It's, it's a will. It's a choice. And it's not based upon the sameness factor. Mm -hmm. It's based upon the concept of a oneness between us. Mm. Okay. So it's not, I love you because I think you're like me. I choose to continue to stay connected to you even when I don't think <laughs> there's anything good happening between <laughs> us, okay? So it's this transcendent, it's a choice. Uh, Gandhi called it a soul force. And this is the stuff out of which nonviolent social change movements are made. Mm. It's this stuff. It's, it's a love ethic that says, 
I'm moving forward here out of this vision, this Martin Luther King dream, this vision that there's a society where all of us, the beloved community, where all of us can be here together. That's the agapeo love. Mm. It's not an emotional kind of thing because you may not be feeling it. <laughs> but that's when you engage in it the most. Mm -hmm. You engage in it the most. That says, I still have a vision of this wholeness here, and I am not going to let anything. Like King says, there's nothing any man can do to make me stoop so low as to hate him because I become as low as the thing I'm hating when, I'm hate, when I hate. Mm -hmm. So it is this, it's the unifying power of the universe. It's that that allows us to get beyond the segregation and the separation and the division. We need to have an agape of love even with our own selves. Mm. Yeah. See, and, and I just want to connect something here. Unconditional loving, this agapeo loving, is perpetual forgiveness. Mm. That's what perfect, per perpetual forgiveness is constantly letting it go, constantly coming back to the wholeness. And it's the same thing. The only way you're going to get to this place of the oneness is to be in a perpetual state of forgiveness. Not overriding it, not pretending like it doesn't exist, still doing the things that have to be corrected, but not getting stuck, see? Not getting so stuck in my rage, not getting so stuck in my anger and my frustration that I feel disempowered, that I can't remember that you too are a human being that deserves um, compassion and, and, and respect so that I don't start acting like you. I don't start, <laughs> I don't start acting like you. You know, there, there's this one little line, and, and I know we're trying to end here, that, that is so touching for me. It's a story that Thich Nhat Hanh tells about a fellow Chinese monk of his who had been incarcerated by, I mean, a um, um, Tibetan monk of his that had been imprisoned by the, by the Chinese mm -hmm. for many, many years and tortured. And when he was asked, were you afraid in prison? And he said, yes, I, I was very afraid. He said, what, what scared you the most? He said, I was afraid that I was going to lose my compassion for the Chinese. Mm -hmm. That's what he was most afraid of. Because if he did that, he wouldn't be a Tibetan monk anymore. Yeah. Do you feel that? Mm -hmm. And all would be for naught. His whole imprisonment would be for naught. <laughs> yeah. Wow. If he lost his compassion for his captors. Mm. Yeah, I, lo I, I love that. It's such a strong note to end on. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I really love about this idea of agapeo love is is that it you know oftentimes i feel like love is sort of associated with a warm fuzzy feeling you think that's what love is supposed to feel like but what you're saying is like no actually this doesn't no. always feel good this is a no. a willing it's a constant yeah. transcending and it's challenging and it's difficult and it yeah. has yucky emotions attached to it yeah. sometimes yes mm. the worse you feel the harder you have to strive towards this mm. Mm. Wow. Well, Reverend, this has been a fantastic conversation. Definitely one of my favorite conversations. So thank you so much for spending <laughs> your you. time with me. Um, on our last note, do you want to just uh, maybe share with the listeners anything that's coming up that you're participating in? I don't know if you have any retreats or any talks or anything you'd like to share or how people can connect with you further. Yes. Um, in fact, I do. There are a number of things that are going to be coming up. Um, I'm going to be uh, the keynote at a peace rally. That's awesome. happening at the Capitol uh, in California at, at Sacramento on March the 24th. And I also want to invite people to go to East West Bookstore mm. in the Mountain View area. Um, I'm going to be there April, I think it's the 24th and 25th, if I'm not mistaken. 
Um, but it's definitely that that weekend. Uh, Friday night, I'm going to be doing a talk about these kinds of issues. And that next day on Saturday is going to be a skills building where we're going to be learning techniques that we can use to move forward in this direction that is sort of like a focus group for a book that mm -hmm. I'm working on um, right now uh, that will be out for the next uh, election. Oh, excellent. I, I right, got right when it to needs a, to come out. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, a publisher uh, saw me at the same conference that you saw me at the Science and Non-Duality, and they've approached me about taking my ideas and putting in a book, getting it out on time, out in time for the election. So we're going to be exploring and uh, trying on some of those tools um, at East West Bookstore. That's excellent. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Reverend Johnson. It's been a real pleasure thank chatting you. to you. I, I appreciate it.